Hi, everybody. I want to thank you for joining me again for our master class, our discussion on all of the different types of structure. When we first introduced it, we were going to be doing this series. I pointed out into the lake and I said, when you go fishing in your lake, if this was your lake, what would be the first thing you would do? Or if you went to a strange lake, a lake you've never seen before, and you looked out there and you see what I'm looking at right now, what you can see in that viewfinder, what would be the first thing you would do? So I posed that question, and I got an awful lot of response from a bunch of people that said they didn't really know. And that's the whole idea behind this class on structure. We said that most all water has no fish most of the time. So we have to be able to eliminate the unproductive water because it's obvious to everyone we can't catch fish if we're fishing where there are no fish. So we have to be able to eliminate all the unproductive water. And that's about 90% of that water it has no fish in it. And identify the spots where the fish are. And we have come to this conclusion, thanks to Mr. Buck Perry, that these areas of the lake where the fish are is called structure. That's the word that he coined years and years and years ago to identify these areas on the bottom of the lake where these fish can be found. So the main idea of this entire, I guess this is the 14th session now, to identify these 17 different types of structure was so that you and I could go out and eliminate that unproductive water and get to where the fish are. With all that being said, today I want to tell you a little story about how I actually began my life, my, my career as a professional fisherman. And it's a story that took place in 1970. So that's a long time ago. But I remember it like it was yesterday. It basically set up the next 35 years. And it all happened on a lake just north of Pittsburgh. It was actually a reservoir. And the name of the reservoir is Shenango. Shenango Reservoir, it's up near a town of uh, Sharon, Pennsylvania. Like I say, about an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh. And there were a few lakes and, and some reservoirs that were around that general area that I had fished previously uh, before I met Buck. And one of them is Pima Tuning. That was a walleye lake. Uh, it was a reservoir, rather, I'm sorry. And then there was Conneaut Lake, which was a natural lake. Uh, that supposedly had a bunch of muskie in it. Uh, and then there were there was Shenango Reservoir, which was more known more as a bass lake. And then just across the border from us, wasn't but about an hour and a half, hour and 20 minute drive, was Berlin Reservoir, and that was the subject of one of our discussions earlier. Uh, and all of these lakes, actually there was another one called Mosquito that we fished quite a bit, was up towards Warren, Ohio, but they're all right in this same general area. So beginning, that's beginning my story. And I ended up fishing all of those lakes that I just mentioned with various different successes and some failures. But when I first met Buck in 1970 on that trip to Florida, and I'm assuming pretty much that everybody knows about that story. If you don't, need to go to my web page or my uh, Facebook and read the story. I think we put it on a blog, and I think the, the actual story is in there about how I met Buck in Florida back in 1970. And the experience I had triggered me to want to know more. When I met Buck, he took some pity on me. He and a bunch of riders were fishing this lake, same lake I was fishing, but I hadn't caught any fish in three days. And when I heard them talking at the local diner about all these fish they were catching, I butted in and told them I wanted to know what they were catching them on. You know, standard question. If you're really catching all those fish, tell me what you're catching them on. You know, and they all kind of smiled and pointed in the direction of Mr. Perry and said, you need to talk to that gentleman right there. So I started talking with them. You know, I interrupted their dinner. But I didn't care. I wanted to catch some fish. Well, he sort of took pity on me, and he told me that if I would show up the next morning, that he'd take me out for an hour or two and show me a little something about how to catch fish in Orange Lake. I said, great. So he took me out. And again, if you haven't read the story, go read it. But the bottom line was the end result in three and a half hours, 
I was party to catching 55 of the biggest bass I'd ever seen. I'm talking, I think the smallest fish was probably four and a half pounds and two or three fish over 10, but a lot of fish in a six, seven pound class. Huge bass. I'd never even seen pictures of fish like that before. And during this three and a half, four hour little morning fishing deal with Mr. Perry, the father of modern day fishing, I was so enthralled in catching fish, he kept trying to teach me some stuff. He was like basically giving me a little clinic while we were fishing. And he kept talking all the way through some of these discoveries he made and how we were catching those fish right then and all of that. I never heard a word. I didn't hear him because every five minutes I'm hitting another big fish and I'm landing these fish. That's all was in my mind was catching these fish. So even though he was trying to give me a little basic education, I never heard a word. And we were catching fish on a lure like I'd never seen before. I just hooked myself. Called a spoon plug, a lure that he'd invented. So as would be a normal reaction from anybody that had been fishing for years like me. And all of a sudden, after not catching any fish pretty near ever in the summer, all of a sudden, I'm party to catching 55, the biggest bass I've ever seen. We're out in the middle of the lake fishing with this lure. So naturally, I attributed that success to the lure. And of course, later on, I found out there was a whole lot more to it than that. But I, I didn't hear what he was saying. But fortunately for me, he made a present to me when we left. He could tell I was interested in knowing more, so he gave me one of his green books, which was published, I think it was 1964, 65, something like that. And he said, you read this. And he said, I promise you, your fishing life will change. Well, not only did it change, but that green book and the experience with Buck set me up for a lifetime of uh, a lifetime career of fishing which most everybody I ever ran into said, man, you got it made. Fishing for a living, that's almost funny. You know, that's so cool. Well, it wasn't always easy. There's a lot of work involved and a lot, of, a lot of times when there were money problems, you know, we weren't getting paid right, but I was determined. And how I got so determined, I'm going to share with you today. When I got home from that Florida trip, actually the whole drive on the way home, all I could think about was all those fish and I thought if I could learn what that guy knew about fishing, I'd probably be in pretty good shape. So I was determined to really get into this book and study it like, I, like he told me. If I would, I'd learn what, what I needed to know in order to catch fish consistently. So on the whole drive home, I'm thinking about it, thinking about it. So when I got home, the first thing I wanted to do was go to one of my local lakes or reservoirs and find out if it worked in my lake. Again, this is a typical uh, response from someone who had no knowledge whatsoever. So I said, I'm going to go to Shenango and see if I can identify that bar and take that same lure and bounce it across there a couple of times, see if I can't catch a fish in Pennsylvania. So that's how I started. So I go to Shenango. Now, back in those days, there were no fishermen out there. In the summer months, there were no fishermen. I must have made... 12 trips to that lake over the next few months. I think one time I saw a couple girls paddling in a canoe. They weren't fishing. And that was it. I never saw any fishermen except one, and I'll tell you about him later. At any rate, uh, I basically had the lake to myself. Now, this reservoir is about, uh, I didn't look it up, but it's about 3,500 acres, maybe 4,000 acres at the biggest. It, it's not, not that big, but it's not that small either. And uh, so at any rate, I launch a boat, I go out, and I locate this bar where I knew where it was and went right to it. I put this old lure on, and I didn't know anything about pattern trolling or following a brake line or some of the things we've already talked about. I didn't know anything about that. Because when I was with Buck, I just hold on to a rod. And he was driving a boat doing all the work. So I thought, well, I'm just going to bounce this lure. I know this particular lure runs to 12 to 15 feet depending on how much line I have out. And when I saw the bar and made sure that it was leading to deep water, it was breaking off at about 15 feet. As 
far as that, as far as I knew, that was good. So I knew I had to hit the bar somewhere around 15 feet. So I had this lure. And all I knew was to just sort of take some sightings and just sort of drive across it. So about 25, 30 feet of water on this side and about 30 feet of water on the other side of the bar and 15 feet up top and then back off that side. And off the front end of the bar, off the end of the bar was about 37, 40 feet of water, I think it was. I came across that bar, tip, 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 tip over the bar and I could feel this lure. Now when it was out in the 30 feet, it was just free running, just free running like this. And when I come up over the bar, when it got to 15 feet, this lure just started bumping in the bottom. I could feel it in the rod tip. And then all of a sudden I come off the other side and it free run. Now, that's not the proper way to troll a bar, but I didn't know any better. I was a dummy. So I didn't catch any fish. I reversed the pass and I kept that up for about an hour. Didn't catch fish. And I thought, well, maybe this only works in Florida. That's how stupid I was. <laughs> but at any rate, I sat there and I had some coffee with me. I always had a thermos of coffee with me. I, I'm Swedish. I drink way too much coffee. Anyway, I drank some coffee and I was thinking about, well, maybe I'll run around the lake and look for some other spots. See if, but I didn't know what I was looking for. And I was sitting on one of these bars, one of these most common structures that Buck had mentioned in his material. So I started driving around the lake. I didn't see anything that made me want to stop. But of course, I didn't know what I was looking for anyhow. If I would have seen something of value, I wouldn't have known it because I didn't know what I was looking for. So I'm running around the lake looking for something. I didn't know what I was looking for. So naturally, I didn't find it. <laughs> so I ended up going back to my original spot and I thought, well, I'll, I'll try this for another half hour or so, and if it doesn't work, I'm just going to load the boat and call it a day, go back home. Now, at the time, I was fortunate enough, my dad had purchased the 14-foot Alumacraft semi-V, you know, the old 14-foot aluminum boat, and I had a 9.5 horsepower Evinrude on the back. That was, my, that was my rig. And I decided, okay, I'll go try one more time. I think it was the third pass. Just going right across the top of the bar, as soon as it free run, I turn the boat around and go do it again. Third pass over, bang. I actually hit a fish. And instantly I could tell it was a good fish. I could feel it. This wasn't no little stinker. This was a good fish. So I got that fish in, weighed four and a half pounds. Now, back in 1970, in Pennsylvania, if you had one four and a half pound largemouth bass, you were some kind of hero, especially if you caught that fish in the summertime. You just didn't see that kind of fish. Well, I knew from what happened in Florida, I immediately put that fish in the cooler, immediately went back, trolling up over the top of that bar, pow, second fish. Flipped it into the cooler, back over, pow, third fish. When all the smoke cleared, I had caught nine big bass all the same size in Shenango Reservoir in Pennsylvania a stringer of four and a half pound bass now the limit in Pennsylvania is six so I kept my six but I, I'll never forget I caught nine before they shut down and it's probably because I kept trolling over their heads I didn't know anything about a casting position back then because by the way I spent my lifetime of fishing and at the time I was 29 years old I was always casting and never catching any fish. So all of a sudden I'm with Buck Perry in, in trolling in three hours I caught 55 huge huge bass. So now that I caught these fish trolling in Shenango Reservoir you couldn't get me to stop and cast. I probably would have caught 30, 35 bass if I'd have known how to stop and anchor down the boat and go to casting. But I didn't know. So I just kept trolling. Now that was my beginning in Shenango Reservoir. First day. And now I was convinced, man, I'm on to something. And I figured if I was really smart, I wouldn't tell anybody about it. <laughs> I'd just be so selfish. I might tell my brother-in-law and my dad, but other than that, ain't nobody going to know about what I considered the magic lure. Oh, man, I found something. Oh, I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> so... I fished for a little bit longer, and, and I couldn't... I couldn't 
corral my excitement. I had to go shoot some pictures of them. I was just thrilled to death. So I, I went back to load the boat up about four o'clock in the afternoon. And another fellow was coming in. I hadn't seen him before. But this other fellow was coming into the boat wrap. He was going to be loading, taking his boat out same time I was. And it was a green 14 foot, I forget to make of it. <laughs> I don't know why I forgot that. But anyway, green 14 foot aluminum boat with a 9.8 Merc. And it basically the same rig like I was fishing out of. And he was a cool looking little dude and we got to talking and, and uh, he said, like most people will say at the ramp, did you catch any fish? I said, well, I got a few today. How about you? He said, no, I, I didn't catch fish. He said, most of the time I fish Pima Tuna over there for walleye. I said, but I decided to try Shenango today, but I didn't, I didn't catch one stinking fish. He said, uh, did you keep any of your fish? Well, I wasn't too sure I wanted to show him all my big fish. <laughs> I didn't want to share this good information. I said, yeah, I kept a few for dinner, but... Uh, in our further conversation he said well you know most of the time the way I work he said uh, I fish pretty close to home he said but today I decided to come on up here you know he said most of the time I'm fishing the river and I said well where are you from he said I'm from Ambridge well let me tell you Ambridge is in the valley uh, it's about 18 miles sort of north of Pittsburgh, of downtown Pittsburgh. Just a little town. And it's in what we call the valley back then. And guess what? I'm from Ambridge. <laughs> so this guy's from my hometown. And I said, well, where did you go to high school? He said, I went to Ambridge High School. I said, well, so did I. And even though he looked younger than me, I find out that we were in the same class. We were seniors together at Ambridge High School. And we never knew each other. So here we are standing at this dock and there's nobody else on the lake. So I figured, okay, I went to high school with this kid. I, I got to fess up and show him the fish. And when I showed him those fish, he about went nuts. He was absolutely, he wouldn't stop asking me questions about what lure, you know, all of the things that you would normally ask somebody. And I said, brother, let me tell you, I ran into this guy in Florida. And I told him the whole Buck Perry story. So I'm talking to this fellow. We find out he's from Ambridge and all of a sudden we're bonding now. We're the same high school. And when I left high school, I went off to Carnegie Mellon University, great university, but it's right there in Pittsburgh. And he went out and got a job and he had a darn good job down in the valley. He was making a lot of money. And he loved fishing. And when he saw those fish, he was so inquisitive of not just what I caught them on, but what I was doing, and you know, and and I told him the buck story. I told him about meeting this guy, and I said I don't have any extra lures. I said, but I want to see you, you know, I'm in one of these packs, and I picked up a five pack which I had with me in the tackle box that this buck had given me, and I discovered inside these five packs they put this little, it's just a little instructional thing that Buck made years ago. I said so. You take a look at this thing, read it when you get a chance, and we'll exchange phone numbers. And if you got any questions, call me. And uh, uh, maybe someday we'll get together and we'll, we'll go fishing together. He said, that'd be great. Well, he called me the next day, noontime, he called me. He said, man, I've read that book and I've reread it and I've read it again. And he said, i got to go fishing with you. We need to talk. He said, how about if I meet you up at Shenango Reservoir? I said, I'm going on Saturday. I said, you want to make me? Come on up. So he came up, and we started fishing, and we went to my bar, because that's the only place I caught a fish, the only thing I knew what to do. And I did have about four of these 100 spoon plugs, and fortunately, the bar was breaking at 15 feet. I don't think we were there 15 minutes, and the fish showed up. He caught fish. I caught fish. I think when that little activity period was over, we had landed about six or eight good bass, big bass, like the time before. There's a whole school of those rascals living on that bar. Uh, and I caught them every time I went there. But this time I caught them with my new friend from Ambridge High School. And he was really excited at that point. 
And oh, by the way, his name was Tommy Forensic. <laughs> That's where I met Tommy. And he was my partner for 15 years in the business. And he was one of those quick study guys and extremely competitive. Scratch golfer as a kid. I mean, everything he did, he did it all the way. He wanted to be the best. It was his mentality. And my mother used to say, you know, that kind of personality is not necessarily attractive, but when it comes to competing, even if it's competing with the fish, it's almost imperative. You've got to have that. I got to win. I can't accept failure, that kind of thing. That was Tommy. So we got started together and we hit up to Shenango probably the next three or four times. And each time we go to that bar, we caught fish. And each time we caught those fish, we shot pictures and sent those pictures to Buck Perry. And after about three weeks, I got a phone call. And Buck and I had exchanged numbers. I didn't want to call him and bother him, but he called me. And he said, man, I'm seeing all those pictures. And he said, you must be some sort of quick study kind of guy yourself because you're catching more fish than anybody uh, that I've had on, uh, on my radar for the last three years. And you're just getting started. He said, you must be studying that book. And I said, I'm reading it every day, every day and every night. You bet. Now, in the meantime, I was still a dummy. I didn't know anything. But Buck assumed that I was getting really good at this structure fishing just because of the pictures. Bottom line was I had one spot, didn't even know how to fish that right. And, but we always had the results. And these bass were big bass and in Pennsylvania, unheard of at that time. Now, it was about our fifth trip together up there and we just kept getting together, going up there. And I said to him one day, I said, let's look around lake, see if we can't find another spot. We're wearing that spot out, but it, it keeps producing. I don't know how big that school of fish must have been. It must have been five, 600 bass in that school. I said, well, we started rolling around this lake, looking at different areas and so on and so forth. And, and by that time, I had read a lot of the Green Book. I've read a lot of this. I'm, I'm getting a little bit smarter, but I really didn't know what I was looking for, but I was looking for something, something other than that one spot. Okay, so came around the corner, see this opening coming through the woods. And it looked like a road came down in there or something. I, I wasn't too sure what the heck it was. And remember now, I'm still a, I'm a, I'm a big dummy when it comes to the, all this structure stuff. And I saw it coming into the water. I thought, I wonder what the heck that is. But I, we just kept on going, went around the lake a little bit. We just took a little tour and we ended up leaving that day. So that night. I called Buck Berry, first time I ever called him. And he was happy to hear from me, very cordial. And I told him that we had found this spot. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but I knew in the green book he wrote about, because I had read it, he said when he's talking about all the different structures, when he got to the man-made structure, he said there's dams, causeways, and underwater roadbeds. Those were the three that he mentioned in the green book. This is a basic book, but he mentioned those three. So I was thinking that maybe that was a roadbed. And I wanted to, I, I got anxious to maybe fish that, hoping to find a, another spot up there that we just weren't catching fish off of one spot. So I said to him, well, when you fish these roadbeds, just how do you do it? So he went on to explain to me, and I touched on this the other day uh, when we were talking about the Lake Arlington event. Uh, but he said, you have to fish both sides of this roadbed where it dumps into the uh, main river channel, assuming that it does. Let me mention right here too. Uh, I forgot to mention the other day. I told you there's one roadbed that won't produce fish. Sometimes you'll find a roadbed that just runs through the lake and parallels the main channel. It never intersects. It never crosses over. That roadbed will not produce fish. Remember, it must lead all the way. So glad I remembered to tell you that. But at any rate, he said one side or the other could be predominant. He said, but you got to check both sides. And he said, when you fish it, the best way of fishing, and he said, you, once you establish what depth you, you're looking to hit, what the top of the road is, he said, you get that lure on, he said, it's best to troll. He said, because you don't know, they might be at right at the uh, spot where it dumps into the channel 
or they could be active and maybe moved up 50 yards up the roadbed. Sometimes they'd be 100 yards up. Sometimes they could be a half a mile up that roadbed. So by far, the best way to check these things is to troll them. He said, I like to troll them from the, from the deep water all the way up that road. Just keep going until you get too shallow, till it reaches the shallows. At which point, he says, I stop and reel up my trolled lure, and then I'll go do it to the other side. That's how I fish them. And he said, now, anytime uh, you hit a fish, you stop and go to the cast. He said, but in some cases, you can't cast because of your anchor and position, because of the depths. And I'm going to explain that to you. When I was at Arlington, we're going to back up to the last discussion we had. When we hit that fish on that roadbed, we were trolling a 700 spoon plug. Medium line length, 17 feet. The fish hit. But that roadbed was so short in distance, it came up pretty quickly and we could anchor in seven feet of water and still hit the channel on the cast. So now we have a casting position. This is the lure that we normally will cast when we need a crankbait in the summertime to fish these different depths. And we can anchor shallower than 10 feet, 10 feet or shallower so that the angle of the retrieve is such that once we sink this metal lure, it's made out of brass, down to the channel, we can start cranking it. It'll stay on the bottom all the way back to the boat. As long as our anchoring position is 10 feet or less. So in the case of Arlington, we anchored down seven feet of water, throwing out, sink the lure down into the channel, this very lure. And once that lure hit the bottom, we crank, Start catching those fish as soon as you come up over that drop off. And that was a perfect situation. That's the reason we caught 38 pass. Perfect situation. And they stayed there for such a long time. But in most road beds, and the one I'm going to tell you about is up in Shenango Reservoir. When I called Buck that night and he told me about trolling's the best way to go until you find a fish and then make sure if you have a casting position that you can anchor shallow enough. So that road bed, the top of the road bed, was about 17 feet, just almost like Texas. This lure only goes to 15 feet. So we had to troll 700 spoon plugs, these lures. So Tommy and I are all excited about we're going to fish this road bed, see if there's any bass on that road bed. We go to Shenango, we put on the right lure, and we go start down there. And I think it was probably, we were there maybe 20 minutes, we hit a bass. Nice bass, same size as the ones in, over there on the bar. Now once we caught that fish, it wasn't right at the drop off. It was up on the roadbed, and that section of the roadbed went for about, uh, let's call it 200 yards. It was a long ways before you got actually got shallower. It stayed at the same depth on top. And as it turned out, I want to mention this right now. I told Buck it was a road bed. It really wasn't. It was an underwater railroad grade. But it, it looks exactly the same as a road bed. And it feels the same. It's the same. We talked the last time about it all being the same. Uh, but this was an underwater railroad grade. And as we got, I don't know, about 50 yards up there, bang, we hit this bass. Well, we couldn't go to the cast because we'd have to anchor in 25, 20 feet to throw to 20 feet. And... I want you to imagine this now. The angle of the retrieve is so steep that you literally pull the lure up off the bottom. It has no chance to stay. If I could anchor in six feet, the angle of retrieve would be such that it would stay on the bottom all the way back to me. But since I have to anchor in the same depth of water that I'm throwing to, it doesn't work. So trolling was what we had to do. So I reverse, went back around and made another trolling pass up there. And we had thrown a marker. Tommy had markers. I'm happy to say he was a little more educated than I was. So he had markers. He brought them. And as soon as we hit that bass, we threw a marker off to the side. But we wanted to about know where we were on that railroad grade. So we reversed around, made another pass coming down through there. And about the time our lures got parallel to that, uh, to, to the marker, bang, bang. We both hit a fish. Oh, man. And they're both the same size. This lake's full of four and a half pound bass. And 
we just beside ourselves now even more so we've got now we've got two spots that we know uh, producing fish so we kept hitting that and pretty soon we went past our marker for maybe another 25 30 yards past the marker didn't catch one that time but before I could turn, loop the boat around we hit another fish 30 yards further up so those fish were moving along that roadbed so we just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. I think we ended up catching 15, 15 fish, about, something like that. And as per normal, we kept our limit and shot the pictures. So I called Buck. I said, thanks for the advice. We fished the what I thought was a roadbed, but it's really a railroad grade. We, we saw a map of it. And we caught about 15, 15, 18 bass, something like that. Kept our limit. And here's the pictures. Well, now Buck's thinking, these guys really are good. But that was the furthest thing from the truth. I still just as stupid as I was the first day I went out there on Shenango Reservoir. But I had, a, I had lured, I had a trolling rod, and I was doing what I was told, and I was learning a little bit. I certainly had the feel of the lure now and how it worked and all of that. So the next time Tommy and I went, to Shenango and it became a regular thing about two days a week we were up there fishing and the next time we went up there we skipped the bar this time we went straight to the roadbed and we made about four or five passes all the way up to the end didn't have a fish so we turned around we went back over and we hit our bar and I don't think we caught a fish on a bar I can't remember but we decided we had had a little lunch with us and we stopped and ate a little lunch and I said, let's go back over to the to the railroad grade. I keep calling it a road bed, but it's really a railroad grade. Same thing. So we go back over. We're going to start making another pass again. 700s. We start down that road bed, and we get about, I don't know, maybe 30 yards past the actual drop off. And Tommy hit a fish. And boy, that rod doubled up. I said, Man, that's a big fish. <laughs> 